welcome to this open lecture. It's my great honor to introduce to you very briefly our speakers today. Professor Deborah Nelson, <laughs> Ms. Amy Goldstein, <laughs> Mr. Shai Alster, <laughs> Professor Deborah Nelson was a member of the winning team in 1997 for investigative reporting. There are a series of stories at the Seattle Times exposed widespread problems in the federal government's Indian housing program. In 2006, Deborah joined the Marriott College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. But before that, she worked five years for the Los Angeles Times as the Washington's investigations editor. And she also reported for Washington Post, Chicago Sun Times. And uh, Deborah's science and environmental reporting has also received wide recognition in the United States. Let's welcome uh, Professor Deborah Nelson again. Right here, that's fine. Thank you, though. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so I have been in China since last week, first at Reming uh, University, and then at uh, Beiwai University, and now here, talking about investigative reporting. Um, I, I've been very impressed and inspired by the students that I've met with. Uh, I have to say that they, gave, they give me a great hope for the future of investigative journalism uh, here in China. Now, the U.S. tradition dates back to the beginning of our country. One of the first investigative stories involved our first president, George Washington. He was taking money from the U.S. Treasury illegally for his own personal expenses. And somebody inside the government leaked some documents to Benjamin Franklin's grandson, who ran a newspaper. He wrote a story about that, and George Washington had to give the money back. Now, back then, the country was new, and so was our right to free speech and press. Um, and the government didn't like being criticized. So they established a law that put reporters in jail for criticizing the government. And in fact, Benjamin Franklin's son would have gone to jail for criticizing the government, except that he died from in an epidemic. Now, since then, in the 100 years, 200 years since then, um, the courts have strengthened our freedom of speech so that today, generally, the government doesn't uh, put reporters in jail for what they say. And we hope that with WikiLeaks, that the courts will maintain a strong protection for um, what we publish. Now, while they don't put us in jail, the, the government can't put us in jail for what we say, they do occasionally put us in jail for what we don't say. So if the government wants us to reveal a confidential source and we refuse, the courts sometimes will put us in jail for that. Now, you have a record of fine and courageous investigative journalism here in China as well. 
And you face your own serious challenges in practicing freedom of the press that's guaranteed in your constitution. Now, whether you're in China or the US, I believe that investigative reporting requires certain character traits. It requires us to, be, to have determination to expose lies and to document truth. Determination because what we write about, a lot of people don't want revealed. And so they try to throw obstacles in our way. They hide information. They lie to us. And so it takes determination to figure out what the truth is. It also requires insistence on methodical verification of facts. We don't write about somebody's political spin on a story or rumors or propaganda. We take extra care to determine, to verify the facts that we put in a story. Now this might mean that we're a little bit slower than other reporters, but when we write about something, it'll stand up. When it comes under attack, it'll stand up. We also have a fierce belief in the power of an informed public to bring about positive change. My first duty is to inform the public. But I have, as my motivation, what keeps me going is that belief that if I inform people, if I give them the facts, that they will move, they will, that by having those facts, will bring about positive change. Now I think that being an investigative reporter also requires another trait, and that's skepticism. There's an old journalism saying, very popular in Chicago where I grew up as a reporter, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. So verification means that we have to check out whatever people tell us, whether they're friendly sources or hostile, whether they're the person where it's giving us information or the person we're investigating. Another important trait, I believe, is resourcefulness. Because so often, people are trying to stop us from doing stories. Sometimes they succeed for a while, but we can't give up. I always say that I work for my story. I don't work for any other boss except for my story. And I'm gonna do whatever it takes if I have an important story to tell, to tell that story. And I won't give up if somebody stops me. And sometimes it's the government that's trying to stop me. In the US, they can't censor me, but they can try to hide stuff from me. Sometimes it's my editor. I don't have, so that's a, been a bigger threat in my career is having editors who are either afraid to do a story or they don't understand the importance. They don't want to give it space or time. But, I find that if I'm resourceful, that won't prevent me from publishing the story. For example, I discovered that in the city of Chicago, there were many um, fields that were saturated with industrial chemicals. They were located in poor areas of the city where people didn't have political power. And so they, weren't, they were left to sit there where school children crossed them where people were in danger, health was in danger. I thought it was important to bring this to light. But my editor was not interested in environmental stories. He didn't think they were important. And plus they were involved a part of the city that he didn't care about. So he didn't let me do the story. But I, that didn't deter me. I couldn't do it at that moment, but I continued collecting information in my spare time and I kept my files on that story, waiting for an opportunity when circumstances might change. And they changed. The paper was, the newspaper was sold to somebody else. And the new owner, the new publisher for the, for the newspaper, his wife cared a lot about the environment. And she wanted us to do environmental stories. So the editor came running over to my desk and said, can you do something environmental? I said, I think I can help you. 
and I pulled open my drawer and pulled out my story, and it ran as a five-part series in the, store, in the Chicago Sun-Times. I wanted to do a story. I discovered a problem that when men um, were hitting their wives, when they beat their wives in the U.S., that's against the law, but police, with the wife reported it to police, they wouldn't take it seriously. And if the case went to court, the judges wouldn't take it seriously. So if a man hit a man, he, he had a better chance of going to jail than if a man hit his wife. That didn't seem fair to me. It wasn't just. But when I told my editor about that, she was not interested in that topic for a story. She liked stories about politics. She didn't think that was interesting. But I didn't give up. I looked for opportunity and opportunity. And one day, a very popular uh, football player named O.J. Simpson was accused of murdering his wife. Suddenly, the issue of husbands hurting their wives became a national hot issue. So the editor came running over to my desk, said, didn't you have something on domestic violence? I said, yes, I think I can help you. And I pulled out my files. So we've got to look for opportunities, always. We never give up on our story, no matter how long it takes. For the environmental story I told you about, it took two years before I could get that in the paper. We always look for those opportunities. Now when the um, editor at the Chicago Sun-Times made it impossible for me to do responsible investigative reporting, even by scheming and plotting the way I usually do, I went somewhere else. So I moved across the country to a newspaper where I knew I'd be able to do that kind of investigative reporting that really supported that. And I think that's important for everybody to remember. There are newspapers and publications in China that have reputations for doing good investigative reporting. Those are, it's, you can create an opportunity for yourself by, by aiming to work at those places. And that's what I did. So I picked up my family, my two daughters and my husband. We all moved across from Chicago to Seattle. And that's how I became a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. It started with an anonymous tip not long after I moved to Seattle. The U.S. government has a program that finances construction of housing for needy families on Indian reservations. In the U.S., as many of you maybe perhaps know, uh, many Indians live on reservations where they have their own governments, tribal governments, and their own rules. Well, the government has a program, and program, there's a great need on those reservations for housing. People are very poor and they live often in trailers and little shanties. There was a need for housing and the government set aside millions of dollars to build that housing. The tip that I received was that on the Tulalips Reservation, which is near Seattle, tribal officials were using that program to build a mansion for themselves. Now when I get a tip like that, I stop and analyze it very methodically. I ask myself first, okay, that's an interesting tip. What facts do I need to verify to determine if that tip is true? Second, I ask myself, where can I get the information to verify those facts? Then I stop and say, which of the facts is easiest to prove true or false. And that's the one I go for first. Because if I prove it's false, I go on to the next tip. If I prove it's true, I go on to the next fact. So here I thought the facts I need to prove, three facts, three essential facts. Is there a big house? That's pretty basic, right? Is it owned by tribal housing officials? And was it built with federal government subsidies for needy families? 
And I stopped to think, where can I get this information? For each of these? Is there a big house? Where would I get that? Maybe just going and seeing if it's there, right? Be an easy one. How would I find out if it's owned by tribal housing officials? Now, when I say find out, I can't use rumors. I want to find out for sure if it's owned there. So I, thinking I can't. I don't want to just ask neighbors because they might say, "Yeah, you know, the house under construction we think is going to be occupied by these tribal officials." I want to be sure that that's the case. Now this is a little bit of a problem for me because usually in the US, property records are public. You can go online, you can look up my address and discover that I am the owner. But on reservations, there are no public records. The records are not public. And property is owned in a different way. There are no records that say who owns that property. So I know this is gonna be a bit of a problem for me to prove. Third, was it built with government subsidies for needy families? Now that I know I can find out. I think about who would know that information. Tribal officials would know, but they're not likely to tell me because I'm a reporter from a non-Indian reporter. I'm not from the reservation, not in the tribe. And plus, that might be some, a fact they want to hide. But in the, in the US, we have a law that gives us access to public records. So if the government keeps records, the, government, the records that the government keeps are really the public's records. They're keeping it for the public. So we can put in a request under the law to look at those records. So the money comes from a particular agency. I can put in a request to that agency for those records. If I didn't have that law, I could also call that agency and ask them to tell me whether, in fact, they were giving money to that tribe to build houses and whether that where the house was being constructed was covered by it. All right, so I look at that and I say, which one is the easiest to prove? Which would you go for? Which one? First one, yeah, exactly. Now, one thing I should mention is my editor was not wild about this story. When I asked him if I could do it, he said, people don't care. The reservation is an hour north of Seattle. Our readers don't really care. But I cared, for some reason, this tip, I just, I cared a lot about it. I really, first of all, I come from Illinois where there are no Indian reservations. So I thought it was, I was interested in looking at that culture. But also there was something about the tip that I just couldn't let go. So on a day after afternoon when I had a little free time, I drove up from Seattle to where the reservation was, got off at the exit to the reservation, past the casino, which is where the mainstream press generally stops, not to gamble, but to write about gambling on um, Indian reservations. Indian reservations don't get much attention in the regular press, um, except for their casino operations and a few other issues. But the tip took me past the casino and through the main part of the reservation where I passed houses that were built out of plywood, very thin wood, and trailers that were rusting that people lived in. Tiny houses where large families, sometimes more than one, were forced to live together. That's where most people on the reservation lived. But the tip kept me going to the very top of the yellow area there, through a beautiful woods where nobody lived. And as I emerged from the woods, there was a construction, a neighbor, a, a, a subdivision under construction. And where I, the tip took me, the address that they took me to, there was a locked gate. Now I tried to look over the gate, but it was very, a lot of foliage. I couldn't see behind it, so I couldn't see if there was a house there. I couldn't climb over it because it was a private residence and I didn't want to climb the fence. That might get me in trouble. As some of you know, I have been known to go under fences, <laughs> but not necessarily in a private residence. So um, I went around 
drove back out, went around to the back, came through a field behind the house, got chased by a dog, <laughs> and there was the house. So, step one, fact one, I had proven. There is a house there and it's big. So the next question was, who owned the house? As I told you, that would be difficult to prove. So I thought, I have a policy. You know, many investigative reporters investigate, they conduct a long investigation and at the very end, they contact the person they're investigating. I tend to contact people early in my investigation because I find that they can tell me useful information. I believe that, you know, the person who has buried the body is the best one to lead you to it, right? So I thought, I'm just going to stop and ask. I'm going to stop at the government office, ask the official that the tipster told me owns the house, ask him if he owns the house. So I stopped on the way back. He was there. I told him who I was. I never lie about that. I, I'm Deborah Nelson from the Seattle Times. And I'm looking at this house under construction. Is it yours? He said yes. So now I have two of my facts. The third fact was whether it was built with government funding for poor housing. So I figured I'm, he's already told me one thing. I might as well, what do I have to lose? I might as well ask him that too. So when I asked him, he said no. Sometimes people lie. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> but I thought I have two things proven that I can take back to my editor and get his approval, maybe to do the research for the third. And he was a good editor. When I took this back, he gave me approval to continue. And so I put in a public records request with the government. And some weeks later, I, while I was waiting for it, I did another investigation about um, you know, hot dogs making people sick at the baseball park. It was a quick little investigation that people in Seattle remember better than this project. But um, I received word that, in fact, the government records were ready for me to look at. I went to look at them, and, and they showed that this was funded by, um, under a program to house needy families. But now the question is, in my mind, was this just one instance of bad judgment? Or did this represent something bigger? That's an important question to ask and to answer. Well, I went back to my office. I couldn't tell from the records. I went back to my office and received another anonymous phone call from somebody different saying, they didn't give you all the records. They didn't give me the emails between the, the Seattle office of the federal agency in Washington. So I called them back, the government agency back, and I said, you didn't give me all the records. They said, well, we don't want to give you those records, and we don't think we have to. But I knew the law well enough, and I said, you must give me those records, and if you don't, you have to write a letter that tells me what records you're not giving me and why. And the press officer said, oh, that'd be too much work. So I knew there were lots of records they hadn't given me. I said, it's the law, sorry. So they decided it was too much work to follow the law, so they gave me the records. And those records showed that, in fact, it wasn't an isolated problem, that this is a problem happening across the US. Now, if I hadn't had that public, I know you're in China, you don't have many public records laws. I believe that even if I hadn't, I know, that even if I had, didn't have that law, that I would have found out that this was a bigger problem. Because soon word spread through unofficial channels, spread from reservation to reservation and tribe to tribe, that somebody from the white press, not the Indian press, but the white press, was looking at housing on reservations and was looking at abuses. And word spread through unofficial channels throughout the federal agency where there are many good workers 
um, who believed in their jobs. And soon I was flooded with tips and documents unofficially from people on um, reservations across the country and from workers for this federal agency from across the country showing that there were other big houses and other abuses all across the country. And so I went through the process of documenting. First of all, I added another, another reporter. Eric Nalder joined me because there was too much for just one of us for me to do alone. And we repeated this process of verification with each tip. And we found problems across the country. We documented them across the country. We found places where, such as in, in Oklahoma, where families, the tribe required families to help build under this program to help, to help with the construction of, the, of their own homes. And after they had helped build their own homes, the tribal officials took those homes away from them and kept them for themselves with the help of government officials. We found that on one tribe, which runs the biggest, one of the biggest casinos in America, a very wealthy tribe where people earn incomes of, a hundred, of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, they were receiving money under this program to subsidize their houses. We found abuses across the country. Now, we had a dilemma, an ethical dilemma. We had found many abuses. If we published this story showing all these abuses, we feared that government officials, that our elected representatives who funded the program, would take money away from the program, would decide that the program was so, had so many problems that they should take the money away. And yet in doing our reporting, we had discovered there was a great need for, for money to build safe housing. So what do we do? We brought on another reporter, Alex Tizan, to go around the country and document the need for safe housing on reservations. So when the stories ran showing the abuses, we also ran stories showing the need. The stories led to a, a big reaction in Washington. In Washington, there were hearings held about the abuses that we uncovered. And new laws were passed and reforms to try to, to prevent this from happening. But I'm happy to say that no money was taken away from the, pro, the federal program. Instead, they tried to find ways to make sure it was spent properly. Volunteers came forward to help people, um, to help improve their housing. And the tribes themselves held a national meeting to stop the abuses on the reservations. Now people have asked how such a massive problem went undetected for so long. One reason is that reservations operated differently than the rest of the US. Their newspapers were owned and controlled by the tribal governments. While some tribes adopted strong constitutions that protected the independence of their reporters in the tribal press. Uh, many censored the press. They would not let, let them write articles that criticize their, their tribal governments. Now an independent, independent press might have uncovered this problem when it was very small and steps could have been taken to stop the abuse. Instead, a small problem grew into a big problem and eventually became a national scandal that could not be hidden. And this is why I believe that an independent press is so important and that it benefits both the government and society to allow the press to serve in its independent watchdog role. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Nelson, for the fascinating lecture.